All right, so first I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about music um, and sort of recorded music in particular and its changes over the past uh, around 50 or so years. So music has been around forever, as you read in the abstract. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a deeply ingrained part of humankind. Um, but recorded music is a more recent phenomenon. Um, it's, it's far more, far more recent. And as such, it's less of a permanent thing. I tend to see it as more of a blip in the history of music. Um, it was really around the 1900s that it started, but as you can see, Edison invented the phonograph in 1877. Uh, records began to be sold in mass during the early 1900s, and by the mid-1900s, um, they were really being consumed by almost everyone. Everyone had a record player, or um, at least a radio, but more and more record players. And, um, and so, Basically, through this, record companies and labels began to be formed because there was money to be made. Prior to this point, music had been entirely a live-based uh, thing. You know, you, you, you went out and you played music. There was no way to take it home and listen to it. But now, um, it was, there was a marketable product that anyone could buy anywhere. You didn't have to be near a concert hall. You just had to have a store that sold them. And so there was a lot of money to be made, so companies were formed. Um, in 1929, DECA was formed. That was one of the bigger ones. Um, and in 1935, EMI was formed, um, amongst many others, and by the 1950s and 60s, record labels were uh, common and well-known. Um, however, labels were, in many ways, although they allowed for the distribution of music um, to be far more broad than ever before, and um, for people who, you know, for example, might not live near a large venue to hear music that they wouldn't otherwise, um, in many ways, they were also a negative thing. Um, Labels were, of course, run by people looking to make a profit. They were not necessarily run by artists. Um, they were looking, the people running them were looking to make a buck, essentially. So whether or not something was artistic really was irrelevant. Uh, the only thing that mattered was whether or not it sold. And so, of course, the, the types of music that were being uh, produced and distributed to the masses were very, very controlled in that manner. Um, additionally, um, record companies were really the only way to distribute your music in this manner at this point. Um, you could not self-release an album. You, first of all, would need a studio to record the album, um, which was very expensive, and unless you had a lot of money, you were really not going to be able to do that alone. Labels would fund the recording of a record um, at that time. Uh, so if you weren't associated with a label, it was far more difficult to record your album. Additionally, uh, producing an album and distributing it, like physical copies of an album, was you know, costly and almost impossible at that point. Nowadays, there are um, independent people who press up records. Um, if you go online and search uh, record production or you know, CDs, for example, um, you can get a limited run produced. But uh, at that point, uh, those companies were run by record companies. So you really could not distribute your own music. Um, and so the record companies really sort of had a monopoly on music at the time. Uh, it was, you, you had to, meet their standards, and whether or not their standards were good is open to debate. Um, but one thing is for certain, they were definitely commercial and they were focused on money rather than art. But things began to change, um, and they began earlier than you would think. In the 1950s was really where I peg it beginning to change, with the invention of multi-tracking. Um, the picture you see here um, is of Les Paul and his wife, uh, Mary Wells, on a show called Omnibus which was, uh, this, this aired in 1953, this episode. Um, and on this episode, they demonstrate uh, the technology known as multi-tracking. It was an invention of Les Paul's. And what it was, was essentially he had um, tape machines. You could, you could purchase reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Um, and you know, the, they, were, they were available for you know, home use. Um, and it basically, he, he configured them in a way that allowed him to record uh, tracks on top of tracks on top of tracks. So prior to this point, uh, when you wanted to record something, you would have to get everyone in one place at one time and have them play it all at once and record it in that manner. But um, with this invention, you could play a guitar part. And on this show, what he did was he would play a guitar part, record that, stop, go back to the beginning, have that part still there, but then play another part on top of it, go back, do it again, and then he had um, his wife, Mary, sing on top of it. They performed a song called Somewhere There's Music. Um, and uh, on that episode, there are, I believe, eight Mary Wells's singing <laughs> and uh, eight Les Pauls playing guitar. 
Um, and at the time, the most that he had ever recorded was 24 tracks, but um, as time went on, of course, the numbers grew and grew and grew. And this uh, episode uh, did not have an immediate impact, but it definitely inspired a lot of people. Um, and of course, you know, the introduction of multi-tracking was huge. Um, studios definitely did adopt this because it was simply more convenient to, you know, if you're recording one part at a time, if someone makes an error, you can just start over and you still have all the other stuff that you've completed up until that point. But it also opened up a lot of doors for people who did not want to um, use studios or did not have the means to use studios. If you had a tape recorder, um, you could do more or less the same thing Les Paul was doing, and you didn't even have to have a band. You could play it all yourself. Um, and so that was really the beginning of the shift. And um, later on, I would say around 1970, a lot of prominent artists began to use multi-tracking on their own outside of a studio setting. One of the biggest ones, I would say, is Paul McCartney. His first solo album outside of the Beatles, he recorded at his farm in Scotland completely by himself. He has no other musicians on the album. He plays drums, bass, guitar, keys. Uh, he has one song where he uses glassware. Um, and he cut it outside of a studio setting without a band, and it went to number one on the charts. Um, this was extremely important for uh, home recording. And many other artists were to follow. Todd Rundgren, Prince, um, the list goes on. Uh, today, we don't use tape, reel to reel tape machines because uh, tape is extremely expensive, it's inconvenient, uh, and a lot of them are broken. They're not produced as much anymore. Today, we use softwares. Um, this is the logo for Logic Pro, which is a Mac program. This is the one that I used when I was recording my album. Uh, Pro Tools is another option. Um, and these are fairly inexpensive programs to obtain. Um, and uh, what, at least when compared to the amount of money that studio time costs today. You can get these, you can record things at your home, at your convenience. You don't need any musicians, all you need is these and some instruments. Um, and so the process has gotten perhaps even easier. Uh, the other major change, and this is more recent, um, is the internet. The internet has um, completely changed music and irreversibly changed music. Um, ever since iTunes was invented, uh, and popularized, which is around the early 2000s, people have started using computers as their primary source for music. Most of the music that is sold today is sold digitally. People do not really buy CDs anymore. Uh, vinyl sales, I believe, make up approximately 1% of music sales in total. Um, the computer is really the primary source, and so people have gone to the computer for music. Um, in addition to iTunes, there has also been the invention of free music on the computer. The internet. Um, has lots of sites where you can stream music um, or download music for free, um, legally or illegally. Um, I have the logo for SoundCloud here. This is a site that I have used to promote my own music. Uh, you can very simply upload a track that you've recorded from your own computer to the internet. Uh, anyone can go and click on it. Anyone can go and download it. Anyone can listen to it. It's very simple. Um, and it's easy to distribute your music now. Whereas before you would rely on a record label to press up records and promote them and send them out, now all you have to really do is upload it to a computer, uh, it, upload it to the internet, it takes no more than probably a minute. Um, and while it's certainly not guaranteed that anyone will hear it, um, I would say it's likely that someone who will appreciate it will eventually stumble upon it. And whether or not that leads to any success, I don't really see as important. The point is you're getting your art out there. Um, however, this, the internet is not all positive. All the, positive. all the changes I've listed so far have been fairly positive. There is a dark side. I would say the dark side is piracy. Um, I mentioned the free sites earlier. Uh, definitely not all of them are legal. In fact, most of them are not legal. Uh, you can easily obtain an album today. Like If I wanted to get the new Jay-Z album, I could go online, Google Jay-Z album, free download, and within the first you know, three links, I would find a link that could get me that album for free. Um, so paying for music has become a choice. Uh, I see this as a fairly negative thing because, um, well, if you're not paying for something, that sort of inherently devalues it. You're not going to value something that you didn't pay for as much as something that you did pay for. You have expectations of quality. You have expectations of pleasure from something that you paid for. Um, and now those expectations are not there. Music has become far more disposable, in my opinion. Um, and not to mention that uh, if you're not paying for your music, artists are not getting money for, for their music. It's become far more difficult to profit off of music today and to be a successful artist. 
Um, however, with that being said, I think from an artistic standpoint, uh, music has become a far more free environment than it was at the height of the labels. Um, there is no longer much of a controlling force. The labels are still there. They still control what's on the radio. However, um, there are many bands who have become famous and successful solely off of songs they've distributed on the internet. Um, and now the labels come to them rather than them going to the labels, uh, which I see as a positive change. Um, so for my project, it's a pretty goofy picture. This is my album cover for my album. Uh, I went by the name Easter. I chose that as my name. Uh, it's a nickname my grandfather gave me when I was a kid. Um, and the album is called We Have Such Straight Teeth. I recorded it um, f over the past few months solely in my bedroom and my basement. Um, I was using uh, one microphone. I was using Logic Pro. And uh, my friend Alex Fabry helped me put together this video of um, what I was doing. So here's sort of a candid look at what I've been doing for the past, uh, I guess, three months. These are some of the people I was listening to a lot while making the album.
nervous about a lot of doing this project, actually. I, I mean, you know, making an album is a fairly big undertaking. Most of the albums I've made have not taken, you know, three months. They've taken, like, six. And that's including writing, recording, mixing, you know, whatever else is to follow. Um, and also, I generally, you know, when I write songs, I generally have a band and, like, we people are bouncing them off who can give me ideas. Um, and in this case, I really did not have that. It was, it was all me. You know, I had all the entire responsibility for Beyond that, like the entire responsibility for playing the music was on me too. I would like you to listen to it as an album, which it is, and that sounds kind of silly, but in my paper, I talk a lot about this. Um, we're in the iTunes generation now, and a lot of the time when people get an album, they don't actually get an album. They go on iTunes, and they buy their favorite song off it, and they just listen to it over and over and over again. And you know, that's flattering too, don't get me wrong. Like, if you're going to listen to my music, I'm, I'm happy. But if you really, you know, if you want to sit down and interact with it the way I want you to, you know, the way the artist intended, I guess, um, you should listen to it in sequence. Cool. So. Uh, so that is what I was working on over the past few months. Uh, that gives you a little look into it. Um, I guess I would like to finish mostly by taking you through like how I would make a song. So I have one of the songs here. This I released as a single. Um, I'm going to pull this up really quick. Um, you heard a clip of this at the beginning. Um, but so uh, just to give you, I'm going to talk a little bit about it and then I'll play it. Um, so the drums on this are actually me putting a mic on an easy chair that's in my room and hitting it with drumsticks. So I started with that. That's what I began with. Because um, you record one thing at a time when you're one musician. So start with the drums. Uh, then I added some tambourine, some shaker, some percussion, also one at a time. Um, then I added guitar. Um, I added several guitars, actually. There's acoustic and electric on here. Uh, I added bass. And I don't think there are any keyboards on this one, but on other songs on the album, uh, there are. So here is this. So I uploaded that um, a few weeks ago. Um, and as a little bit of evidence that someone will eventually find your music, um, a couple of days later, I was followed by a very small uh, independent record label based out of Brooklyn. So there you have it. Um, and uh, thus concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'll take questions now. Yes. You said you wanted people to. Um 
you listen to the whole album. Yes. Just, you know, sample yes. Songs. Was there a theme behind the whole album? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd say there probably is. Um, I guess, I don't know, over the past few months I've had a lot of feelings of uncertainty about the future. Um, you know, I'm going off to college next year. Uh, I broke up with my longtime girlfriend before making the album. That definitely appears here and there. Um, and uh, so yeah, I guess sort of feelings of uncertainty. And also the title is sort of a critique of a lot of, um, I don't know, it's, it's a bit of a whiny title, but um, We Have Such Straight Teeth is the title of the album, and uh, one of the songs, uh, the lyrics are, you and I have such straight teeth, we are straighter than we'll ever need to be, but do they give your smile any charm or sheen, honestly? And so that's sort of a criticism of what I see to be a flaw in Newton, which is a lot of people are very focused on, you know, um, succeeding tremendously academically or running really fast, but they're sort of, I don't know, they're, they're, they're kind of hollow people sometimes. Um, and that's, you know, that's obviously my own personal prejudice and that's just how I feel. But So those are some of the themes. Uh, the album is released tonight. Um, there will be a link posted on my website uh, to download it for free. So you can check it out and tell me what you think then. Uh, any other questions? Um, I guess on that same theme, um, how did you sequence the songs? Did you have a hard time? Yeah. <laughs> It is. It is. I spent probably a week trying to figure out um, what order I would put them in. I tried to start the album off. That the song I just played is the first song on the album. Um, it's very quick. It's very fast. It you know it tries to hook you almost immediately. The vocals come in, you know, right at the beginning. Um, and I tried to start the album on sort of an upbeat note. There are a few sort of happier sounding songs, so I put those towards the beginning so that the listener, you know, will be like, oh, okay, this is good. You know, I can like dance to this. I can you know I can like think happy thoughts to this, and then I put the heavier stuff towards the end, um, you know, so that if either, either they'll be, they, they will have stuck with it long enough that they will listen to the heavier stuff and hopefully enjoy it as well, or, you know, at least they heard something before they bail out. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was you singing, I assume, right? Yes. Yeah. Alan, did you alter your voice much? Because I know, like, you know how there's the auto tune. Oh, no. No, I didn't. I <laughs> yeah. did not do that. I, um, I double-tracked my voice, and I added um, harmonies. Double-tracking is there's two of me singing at once. Um, uh, and I do that mostly just because I'm... Double-tracking makes your voice sound thicker and fuller, um, and I'm fairly insecure about my own voice, so it sounds nicer to me. Um, but as far as alterations go, no, I didn't alter pitch or anything of that nature. And I'm just curious, when you went recording it, like let's say you had uh, the first verse and then the chorus, sure. which is going to repeat for the second verse and the chorus. Did not loop, no. Okay, I was yeah. just wondering, so you, you played it straight through. Yes, and then, yeah, yeah. Which I would expect. Yeah, like that. <laughs> you know, and then um, another question I have is just like, what about YouTube? You know, do you think YouTube gets more exposure than SoundCloud, because you know I know Lily Allen and sure. you know, people like that. Yeah, um, well, certainly Lily Allen is a good example of someone that's gotten famous off the internet. She was really big off MySpace. She posted a lot of songs to her MySpace page, and they were discovered by tons of people, and subsequently by a label, and then she was signed. YouTube can be good. A lot of people have uploaded videos to YouTube, like uh, Macklemore, who has become huge, who I'm not really a fan of, but his video for Thrift Shop became huge smash sensation, and you know he just won four Grammys and. You know, very successful. Um, it can work, but YouTube has such just a mass of, it's, it's so saturated. There's so much stuff on YouTube to wade through. I really, the few times I've uploaded things to YouTube, it hasn't been as successful as on SoundCloud. Because with SoundCloud, you really have like a directive. YouTube, there's, you know, there's comedy videos, there's sports videos, there's videos of all shapes and sizes, and SoundCloud is strictly focused on music. And even with that, you can like say what genres your music falls under, and then people will look for it there. Um, so it's far more concentrated, which I like. Sure. You talk about how Les Paul and the multi-tracking is how commonly it's used. Yeah. Um, but whenever I watch, I feel like when I watch movies about people in recording studios, they're always getting upset because they're trying to play the song all the way through and, you know, they get mad because they're like, you screwed it up, why'd you screw it up, we got to start over, we're paying you by the minute, and it's like $100 a minute. So right. why do you think that, I mean, if it's a question, why isn't more exposure, or why isn't it made more widely available that multi-tracking is pretty much the way that a lot of people, especially in recording studios, tend to... Tend That's to interesting. Um, I haven't noticed that as much, but uh, 
I think people like to, I mean, if, if, are you saying like it's marketed to people that everyone records everything at once and like? I think, yeah, that's the impression yeah. that I get. I think, I think probably because the public likes to believe that like their band is like, you know, playing together and, you know, like, but, you know, in reality, like I've gone, I've recorded in a professional studio before and when you go in, you know, typically you will cut drums and bass at the same time, but that's about as much interaction as the musicians will get. Um, you know, the guitars are all cut separately. The, lyri the vocals are completely cut separately. Um, and as far as traditional studio standards go, that's how it works. Just because it's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if one person messes up, um, it's okay, you know, because you can, like, if you've, if you've already recorded drums and bass and you're recording guitar and someone messes up, it's not like you have to do the drums and bass over. The drums and bass are still there. So all you have to do is redo the guitar part. Um, and uh, that's just more efficient and easier. And I would say it's the industry standard at this point. Did you always know that you wanted to do an album for this project? Did you go through a series of eliminating other projects? Is, is oh, for like when I wanted to sign up for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my main motivation was just dropping all my classes and playing music all day. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, was, that was what interested me about senior year project initially. But I learned a lot. It was, it was definitely a beneficial experience. Yeah, I was going to ask you what, what surprised um, I guess how hard it was to focus <laughs> at times. Um, I definitely did lose focus at points. Um, when you're all alone, you, there's no one telling you, do this, do that. Um, you really have to self-motivate a lot more. And um, while North does tend to pride itself on being a somewhat hands-off environment, in reality, like, you know, parents are always breathing down your neck or like a teacher is like, you need to turn this in or your grade will be, you know, horrible. Um, but when you're out of school for three months, that sort of disappears and you're really on yourself to push yourself to make something. Um, and that was something that was sort of um, new, but I feel like I've gotten a lot better at and I feel um, pretty happy about that. I was going to ask if you had any, besides the focus, if there were other challenges in terms of recording. Sure. Uh, yeah, mostly the ones listed in the video with equipment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like there are a bunch of demos that I have on my computer um, that are like recorded all with like a gaming headset, like something that you use like while you're playing video games. Like, oh, you know, get him. And um, those mics are not meant for fidelity at all. Like they're, you know, they're just meant to communicate noise. Like you'd probably be better off with an iPhone microphone, but I don't own an iPhone, so I, I use the gaming mic uh, to record uh, a bunch of stuff, and it's all really trebly and tinny, and so I was kind of scared, like, wow, you know, I really need to, like, get some equipment, otherwise this album is just going to sound awful. Um, and thankfully, uh, I was able to borrow um, a nice Sterling uh, microphone from my friend Sam, as well as an interface that you can plug it into to get it into your computer. Um, my friend Jake loaned me a guitar. I didn't own an electric guitar. He loaned me one. I got another one from another friend um, so that I had a little variation. And my little brother has a really nice acoustic guitar um, that I borrowed from him. And so really, um, finding gear, I guess, was a bit of a struggle. But thankfully, I had a lot of people that liked me that had nice stuff that I could borrow from. Uh, so you really can do it on the cheap if you want. Like I, didn't, I paid no money making this album, um, just lots of time. All right, we've got to cut you short here. Thank you. Okay, thank you for coming. All right.